Knoxville Game Design, April 2018, Human Computer Interaction, with Levi Smith and Dylan Wolf. Welcome everyone to the April 2018 Knoxville Game Design Meeting. Uh, we are developers in the Knoxville and East Tennessee area, and we develop games and uh, talk about, share our game development knowledge once a month to everyone out there uh, in the world. Uh, so this month, uh, we have myself, I'm Levi Smith, I'm in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and also we have Dylan Wolf in Lenore City. Hello. So I'll start off with a little bit of news. Uh, we got... Code stock here in Knoxville coming up pretty soon. I think it's two weeks away, a little bit less than two weeks away. And Dylan, you're going to be doing a talk on LinkPad, LinkPad Cookbook. At, yeah. Uh, let's see here, two fifteen p.m. on Friday. Yeah, and this is this is not really a game development talk. It's more just um, like in in my job, I end up using LinkPad to do you know, a bunch of little things to help me out, um, you know, to go through test data, analyze like, you know, XML files or JSON files I'm working with. And just like all the little things you can do when you have this sort of like interactive environment, you know. So <clears throat> it's yeah. probably not going to be anything new for most people. And if you already use something like, if you're already familiar with something like Python, you know that this sort of thing exists. <laughs> yeah, I know nothing about LinkPad. I've heard of Link before. Whenever, like, I used to use uh, C Sharp, it always like included Link L I N Q. Uh, yeah. So, so is LinkPad is it a tool or is it an actual like scripting language? It's a tool. So basically, you can write VB.net, you can write C Sharp, you can write F Sharp. You know, just like you would in Visual Studio. Um, the difference is, um, you know, like you've got a window and it's made where you can just like take an object and dump it out in a good like visual uh, representation and you can just run stuff really easily. Like you don't have to set up a console application that's just a single file. The name LinkPad, I think it comes from the fact that it was built to kind of be an interface for writing Link, like back when Microsoft first came out with Link. So it, it can connect to a database and you can do, you can write your, like practice writing your link queries there, but I very rarely use it for that. Sounds very cool. Uh, yeah, so that's going to be, uh, let's see, your April 20th, uh, just about two weeks away. So yeah, I was just going to say Codestock, you can find it at codestock.org. I'm not sure if there's still tickets left. Uh but uh, I know it's it's been going for uh, for a, uh, quite a while. I know Mike Neal and uh, started up back at Pellissippi State or used used our facilities at Pellissippi State, and it's got to been it's got to be like ten years going now. I'm guessing. I think so. I can't remember. Like we may have already passed the ten year anniversary, um, but. Yeah, I know you've been helping out with code stock for quite a while. Too, I right? actually not really like not I really. haven't done anything. Like I was, I was kind of like one of the officers for the .NET user group mm -hmm. when Mike started Code Stock, which was kind of an offshoot, but I had very little to do with. So yeah, it seems like it grew out of the .NET users group here in Knoxville. I think yeah. the first Code Stock I went to was like in 2011 and. Yeah, they had a lot of good game design talks and everything. And, uh, yeah, I remember when I started going to it, they were at the UT Conference Center. And, like, two or three years ago, they moved across the street to the Knoxville Convention Center, the larger yeah. facility down there. So, yeah. So, yeah, definitely anyone in the Knoxville area, check that out. Um, two weeks away. Uh, we got Ludum Dare coming up. Uh, let's see here. And and it's also the same weekend. Uh, so we're going to be doing a Ludum Dare kickoff. It's going to be at Token Game Tavern. I'll put up information on how to get there for that. We'll meet at 7 p.m. on Friday, April 20th. And we just get together 
and talk about uh, basically we get on get together we wait for the theme announcement it's kind of like a new year's ball dropping type thing and talk about our game ideas and basically what's been going on uh in with Ludum Dare. So basically Ludum Dare, if anyone's not aware of it, is a 48 hour, 48 or 72 hour game development competition. The 48 hour version called the Compo version, you develop everything from scratch, uh, your art assets, your sound, the game code, everything from scratch. Uh, there's a jam version, which they, they call it the jam which is 72 hours, so you have until Monday evening, and you can use pre-existing assets. Uh, so after the competition's over, everybody gets online, and everybody rates each other's games. There's like five or so different categories, like graphics, sound, theme, uh, innovation, or something like that. So, so yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. So I was going to mention, uh, let me go ahead and share out my screen here. Share screen. Uh, I'd been working on a video since I just mentioned Ludum Dari. Uh, let's go back. So I've, this this will be five years for me of doing uh, Ludum Dare, uh, 15 straight game jams. I know, Dylan, you've been doing it for quite a while too, but uh, I've made this compilation video. I'm about halfway through. Um, of all the games that I've developed. So it kind of shows in the upper left-hand corner gameplay of the game, and then in the lower right-hand corner, me actually developing the game. So you just kind of see all the games that I've made over the years. So I'm hoping to have that done hopefully next week. Um, so another uh, event in Knoxville is B-Sides, which I'll be attending. Really not game development related, but it's basically computer security and uh, things like that. Um, cryptography, PKI. Uh, so it's a very uh, informative conference. This one day is going to be May 18th, so we still got a, a month away for this one. But it'll be at Scruffy City Hall, uh, Market Square, that area. And it's only $25, so definitely good value uh, if you are interested in computer security and cryptography. Um, and as always, Momocon's coming up next month. I'll be attending that. Uh, they have a pretty good indie game uh, presence there with many indie game booths. I won't be running a booth myself, um, but if you're in the Atlanta area, that's definitely one to check out. Um, I haven't heard of any breaking news from GDC uh, this year. Uh, I think it was last month, but I haven't heard any new news coming out of there. Um, I did see one thing on Facebook. Let me share that out about Steam keys. Apparently Steam is uh, changing the way that they issue keys for developers. Um, I just briefly skimmed through this. Um, but it sounds like they're becoming more restrictive uh, on how they give out keys and uh, basically how they do the key request process. Uh, so if you are on Steam and looking to generate Steam keys, it sounds like they may make it a little bit more difficult or just changing the process of requesting those keys and getting those keys approved. And finally, I'll mention on the Knoxville Game Design uh, Facebook group, which you can join on Facebook. Uh, we have someone that posted for some assistance. They're looking for uh, some help with the game idea that they've been thinking about. Um, I don't know much about it or anything, but it looks like we've had a couple of people jump in and offer assistance. So I think that's great that people are uh, communicating and uh, sharing ideas and helping each other out on the Facebook group for Knoxville Game Design. So that's uh, that wraps up the news. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, go to the show off portion of the show. And Dylan, did you have uh, something you wanted to show off this month? 
Uh, yeah. Let me uh, let me hit screen sharing here if I can remember how to do it. Uh, uh, it's the three little dots. It's not the three dots on the browser, but if you move your yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right. So um, I don't have a ton to actually show off, but this may be something that um, if we got some free months, I can do some demos of. I started messing around with rewriting the the kind of Metroidvania platformer um engine i guess you'd call it uh that i've shown off before uh this time though i am not using um uh the 2d toolkit since unity's 2d features are are actually uh, a little bit better now um i'm also trying to use uh the, the unity ui system as much as possible so you can see like you know that menu is whereas before i was using sprites like here it's completely um controlled through uh the ui function um yeah. so there's some interesting things that i i i uh, i learned about like the ui system about text mesh pro uh which is a a tool that unity bought um Actually, let me see if I can find that. So one of the things I used in doing this as a reference, Unity has this asset called the 2D Game Kit, which is a essentially a full 2D game with, you know, like all kinds of different features. Like, I think it actually gets into, you know, like the UI elements and stuff like this. Um, but, you know, it was a really good example of going in and seeing how, you know, a a platformer works how you would how you would build a platformer that has like you know a really good feel um and also i'll bring up <clears throat> um so like you know like the player character is written entirely in c sharp it's it's um you know it's not using like the uh platformer character asset um so I found it helpful to go in and see, okay, how do they check and see whether you're grounded? How do they check and see whether you're jumping? You know, how do they animate it? Things like that. I and think they that's also the best way to learn game development is just take a fully functional game or some example, then just get in there and start changing stuff and figuring out how things work. I mean, trying to write a game from scratch can be pretty daunting. So it sounds like this yeah. is a good tool for learning how to do that. Yeah, it's not, I was going to say, it's not something that you could use as a baseline, but what I did was I went in and said, okay, I want to implement jumping. Let's see how they implemented jumping, and I'll kind of pull piece, you know, piece by piece out into my blank projects, you know, to kind of um, take the bits that I want and leave the bits that I don't. Um, and actually, I can send you a link to that after we're done here, if oh, you want to put great. that in show notes. Yeah, I'll put that up there. Um, the other thing I looked at was Text Mesh Pro, um, which is now free. Um, this is kind of an alternate way of handling text as opposed to just the normal font. Um, text Mesh Pro will actually let you create a sprite font where you've got your, your texture atlas of, um, of all your different characters. Because one of the things I did when I started messing with this this metroidvania game is i've got my own sprite font and i like the you know kind of the hand-drawn look of that so i was able to pull in text mesh pro and use its text ui elements um which was kind of tricky because it's you know it's not at all obvious how it works and so possibly once i get back to unity uh you know doing more game development because i've been kind of busy like this you know, I'll, I'll maybe have some blog posts or maybe do some some uh, talks on that uh, if if we've got time. Yeah, that'd be uh, very cool. I know I've heard about this tool before, Text Message Pro, and I think it used to be one of those is developed by some third party. Then you yeah. consume them and put it out there for free. So. Yeah, it's one of those things that kind of fills in. Like like I said, it they've got a whole separate set of UI elements, so it's not just like you. It's not just something where you can just substitute and you know text mesh pro for you know into an existing application um, you know without some work. 
but it really fills in a lot of the gaps that, um, you know, like if you run a, into something that Unity won't do with text, then it's not a bad idea to, to take a look at this. So that's pretty much all I've got. Oh, so. okay. Yeah, that, that sounds very cool. Yeah, now be looking forward to maybe in a future month, maybe having a talk on that if you could do that for us. And... Yeah. Okay, let me, uh, so I had a couple of things I was going to show off. So I kind of finished up my, let me switch back to me, my Easter egg hunt game, share screen. So I kind of did this just as kind of like a little holiday mini game. So I'm just going to show the video, which makes things simpler. So I did like a little developer commentary. Uh, basically, you have four, one of four bunnies you can select from. They're all the same, pretty much, except for the color. Uh, but this is like kind of like my first party style game. The objective, it obviously, is to collect the eggs. Um, I have where one of the egg colors is the bonus color. So if you collect that bonus egg, then you get additional points. Uh, but that doing that, it really wasn't that fun because it was like, oh, just a race to the egg. So I added some power up, some items. So you got the uh, carrot here, which will give you bonus speed for a limited period of time. And then you have these, uh, these stars over here that you can collect. And that will freeze your opponents for like a short period of time. Um, so yeah, I'd like to develop this game further. I don't know. Um, I have four little cameras around here so you can get a close up view of each of the bunnies. And then as you collect the eggs, the eggs go in to the baskets. So you have kind of like a visual representation of, uh, of the eggs that you've collected. Let's see what else did I have? Uh, oh yeah. So one interesting thing that I found was... Somebody actually, there's actually a speed running, uh, at least one person is speed running Kitty's Adventure. Yeah, I didn't think now, there were. Uh, which is my game on Xbox 360. Oh, they're showing a commercial now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's very cool. It looks like this guy completed the game in a minute and 39 seconds. I didn't know it was possible to run the game that fast, but. Uh, uh, I don't know. It seems like I've seen some posts or some articles about designing games for speedrunning. That really wasn't my intention for this to be a speedrun game, but I guess it does lend itself to be that type of game because the levels are randomly generated each time. And I do have like a timer uh, at the end of each level that shows how long it took you to complete the level. But it looks like this guy has some overlay where it's automatically tracking how long it's taking him to complete each level. I have no idea how this guy is doing this, uh, unless he pulled it off Xbox somehow or or how this is happening. But <laughs> it's pretty cool. I appreciate people out there speed running the game. Um, and anywhere, if anybody wasn't aware, it is a free game, so anybody can download it. Maybe that's one of the other things that lends itself to being a speed run game. I mean, it's a free game. Anybody can download it and play it. So everybody's got like an equal opportunity. Okay, so the topic for this month is designing games for humans or a Rosetta Stone for computers. So I kind of just, it, this is kind of like a potluck presentation. Uh, it's based in a class that I had years ago at Georgia Tech, the Human Computer Interaction course. I believe my instructor was Gregory Abowd for that course. So I'm going to try to take what I learned in that class is, it's been a good opportunity for me to go back and like go over my notes again. I have my notebook online, so these old things that have been in my head kind of refreshed them in my brain and everything. Uh, but I did throw in a lot of other things, some of my own thoughts and some things from about languages and parsing languages and things like that. So go ahead and get started here. So. When you're designing a game, I mean, it's easy to make a game, but you got to actually think about the person who's actually playing the game. And these are the factors that I came up with that you have to uh, be aware of on the human side when you're developing the game for a human. Human has short-term memory, the input methods, how you're going to feedback 
the response to the human playing your game, how to design a game for the human's long-term memory, uh, the reaction time, timing, and decision-making. So I'll go ahead and start talking about short-term memory. From what I've seen and what I've always heard, a human can remember in their short-term memory seven plus or minus two items. Uh, seems like in practice I've heard it's actually five to seven items. So I have a little example here. Can you memorize these 42 letters? So probably not many people can just like look at this random string of characters and memorize this just looking at it for a couple of seconds. And the short-term memory is a little bit different. I mean, you can quickly remember like seven, five to seven items, and then maybe a minute or two later, that information is completely gone, opposed to long-term memory where that gets stored for an extended period of time. But if you take these letters, the same letters, and the same number of letters, and you make it apple, orange, banana, kiwi, blueberry, grape, and coconut, you can remember that in your short-term memory because it's seven items. And then the way the human brain works, you can actually spell these seven words. So that's 42 letters that you can quickly remember. But it's because your brain is chunking these as individual fruits, individual words, and you can unwrap those words into their actual characters. And actually, just as a quick trivia uh, bit right here, this is actually a Caesar cipher of these letters right here. So if you go up one letter from each of these, uh, you'll get this string right here. So that's another way when you can derive uh, a set of information from an, one... You can derive one set of information from another set of information without actually having to remember uh, all the individual characters. So like an A goes to a B, P goes to a Q, all the way to the end. Uh, so here's some examples of short-term memory. This is the reason why license plates, this is not my license plate, it's an old ex picture of an old expired Tennessee license plate that I found. Uh, on the internet, but the reason why license plate numbers are six or seven characters and why phone numbers are seven characters or seven numbers digits. Uh, so here are some of the input methods for uh, the way you can a human can provide input in, to the CPU. First of all, you have like a controller or a mouse, a keyboard, or a touchpad. These are some of the kind of standard input methods for gaming. It's gonna mention the mouse, it was developed by, or the concept of the mouse was invented by Douglas Engelbart. Um, a lot of these things came out of Xerox Park, the Palo Alto Research Center. Um, I can't remember if he was actually at Xerox Park or not. But, yeah, back in the 70s, here's an interesting picture that I saw of the original mouse prototype. I don't think this was developed by Douglas Engelbart, but somebody used his design to make this. And I was looking at it here, that looks really similar to like a serial port for an old computer, which I thought was pretty interesting. Let's see here, go back over here. And for each of these input devices, uh, they either provide a Boolean, a digital signal to the CPU, or an analog, a digital is like a Boolean, a uh, true, false. The mouse is either, up, or the key is either up or down, the mouse button is up or down, or an analog value. So the analog is kind of like a float, like if you have a joystick, how far in each direction you've actually pushed the joystick, or like a trigger button where the amount that the trigger has been pulled uh, returns a float value, so you can get different sensitivities of the trigger pulls. <clears throat> um, here's some alternate input methods. Uh, so one of the first uh, pointing devices was called Sketchpad by Ivan Sutherland. And let's see here, I do have a link for him. And I'll post all these links to the website. Copy this guy here 
yeah, so Sketchpad was developed by Ivan Sutherland in 1963. It's a little drawing program. There's actually videos on YouTube, which are is kind of interesting. So this is your basic light pen. You can draw lines, move it around, things like that. So it's like one of the original pointing devices. And I kind of think like this was the forerunner to the light gun, like the NES Zapper. Uh, which basically you pointed at the screen, you pull the trigger, and the screen would flash, and then that would feed back to the light gun where you've pointed uh, the gun at. And from what I've heard, uh, light guns don't work on LCDs. I'm not sure exactly why. So if you have a CRT, I would hold on to it. I've got a couple of old CRTs myself just so I can go back if I wanted to and play old light gun games. <laughs> um have the Wii Mote from the Nintendo Wii that was based on infrared technology. Um, the thing that I always complained about with the Wii Mote was it wasn't a true pointing device. Is basically a relative pointer, so you always had to collaborate it with the uh, infrared emitter that you put on top of your screen. Uh, Connect is one of the more recent uh, input methods that came out with Xbox 360 or uh, halfway through the Xbox 360's life cycle, and uh, I, th I, th I thought it was good technology. Uh, it has a couple of different cameras which detect human movements, and it can create a skeleton structure and de determine the bones in the human body, which I think is very cool. I could see using that possibly in game development for doing motion capture. The problem using the Kinect as a game... Uh, game input is that it needs a lot of space uh, you have to ca calibrate it and one weird thing it's always listening and watching <laughs> which uh, I don't know it seems like that's becoming more accepted these days with the like the Amazon Alexa and on all that good stuff so um, and finally we got the microphone what makes a microphone different is it records audio input and I don't know of too many games that used a microphone as an input, but I know a lot of like karaoke games, it can actually deter determine the pitch of your voice, if you're in tune or not. So, and also we have the dance pad, which is basically buttons, but you're using your feet. Um, I was going to throw this in, Optical Character Re Recognition, OCR, as another input method. And it's not like an actual real-time input method, but... Uh, it's a way to feed information to the computer that has been generated by a human by, like, handwriting. The difficulties with OCR, well, I don't know if there will ever be OCR that cor correctly detects the difference between the lowercase l and the number one. Like, a human can see they look the same, but based on the context, like, if you see the letter L at the beginning of a word, then you know it's a letter, like love or like or whatever. But if you see the, the same thing in a like a phone number, then you know it's the number one. Same problem with capital zeros or capital O's and the number zero. And as I mentioned, yeah, basically human can determine what it is by context usually, but a computer usually can't. Um, but yeah, having a computer parse human writing, that's always been a problem because everybody's handwriting is different. And if you extend that into cursive writing, uh, I don't, that's one of those NP hard problems. I don't know if that'll ever be solved. And also another input method is using barcode readers or QR codes. Now the one benefit of a QR code is it has like the three dots or the three boxes in the corners as reference points. So it kind of constrains uh, that input uh, so you know exactly where the information is stored. And there's also a standard for QR codes where, as human writing, there really isn't a standard because everybody's handwriting is different. So in, in my class years ago, 16 years ago, we lear learned about perceived affordance. And this was in a book called Design of Everyday Things, which uh, I'll just show it briefly here. Stop screen share. So yeah, Design of Everyday Things by Donald Norman. So... It's a pretty good read. We used it as a reference book uh, in our human computer interaction course. Go back to share screen. 
And like perceived affordance was one of the big things that was that I learned from that book. Basically, when you design something, you want to make it uh, look and feel as it should be used. So the classic example is like a, a doorknob or a door handle. If you have a door handle that sticks out where you can grab it, then the perceived affordance is that you would expect a user or a human to be able to grab it and pull it open to open the door. Now, if you have a door with a bar on front, then that the perceived affordance is that you would push the bar forward. So you wouldn't want to have a bar on a door that you would pull or a handle, a grabby handle on a door that you would push. So I tried to apply this to games. I kind of think of like the old fighting games like Final Fight. Uh, you have uh, power-ups or items like a hamburger or a drink that would restore your health. So you would think that, hey, that's going to refill my life. Now, you don't really think that the player is hungry and he's actually going to uh, eat the hamburger to make it the person no longer hungry. It's kind of just like a symbol or something that uh, relates that item to what it does. And the same thing with like the Resident Evil games. You go up to a typewriter to save your game. Now, the, you don't expect the character is actually going to like type an essay on the typewriter, but it's just kind of like a representation of what that uh, item is going to do. Uh, another example I thought of last night is like in the Yakuza game, uh, you go to a telephone booth to uh, save your game. So, so just uh, some things on object design. Um, so feedback methods, we have the CPU. There's like three different ways that I thought of to feedback information from the CPU or from a game to the human. Uh, first of all, probably the most common is visual methods such as a computer monitor. Uh, I was going to mention JCR Licklider and Vanavir Bush did a lot of early work on computer uh, display interfaces. And I got information on them that I'll share in the show notes. Um, another one is audio. So basically your computer speakers. Uh, there's an interesting thing in uh, human-computer interaction called the cocktail party effect. Basically, that means if you have a lot of different conversations go out, going on at the same time, then the human brain can pick out one of those conversations and like solely focus on that one conversation and kind of like blot out or ignore everything go else going on. But at the same time, if there are signals, if one of the other conversations you hear your name, then the human brain will all of a sudden like drop that conversation and devote its attention to this other conversation. So that's just something to be aware of in games. I know like if you're like games with a lot of things going on at the same time, you want to make sure that what you want the player's attention to be on uh, actually has that devoted to it. The third uh, feedback method is tactile. Uh, and also this is called a haptic interface. I know that term is getting more use. I saw it on my iPhone is like haptic feedback. So that's basically your tactile feedback, things that you can feel with your hands or other parts of your body. The classic example of this is a rumble pack, which I think the first rumble pack was for the N64. And I think most controllers have the rumble feature built in now. I think it's just a way to add additional feedback. I don't know of any games that are actually based on uh, tactile feedback. It's like, oh, your computer, your controller rumbles. Now I need to do something. But that that would be something interesting to explore. So I was going to talk a little bit about, and we're talking about languages and words and things like that, feedback methods. So first of all, I was going to compare a human word or human language to computer language. So a human word is basically a collection of characters. Uh, there's many different character sets out there for different languages. I think we're most familiar with the Latin characters that we use in English. Uh, and typically, these letters correspond to different sounds. I know there's a lot of exceptions, but typically that's the way it is. 
Um, in Japanese, you have kana, which actually pretty much relate directly to sounds. Again, there are some exceptions, and the kana uh, are sometimes represented by symbols, which are the kanji. Um, but in other languages, like Russian, you have the characters. Spanish also uses the Latin characters. And Korean, this may look like pictographs right here, but these are actually distinct characters. Usually in Korean, this is Hangul. Uh, the characters are usually in groups of two or three, so these are actually individual sounds right here. And these characters are put together to create a word. So a word is a rep representation of a concept. Here I have all these different ways of representing an apple. So it's just a way to represent an object or a verb or something like that. So basically, I talked about the characters and words, and the words are used together to make a language, a human language. And this is basically just a sequence of words in different languages. These words are put in different sequences to have meaning, like in English and a lot of the, like the uh, Romance languages like Spanish and French and Germanic languages like English. This is in the form of a sub subject, verb, and then an object. Now in the Asian languages like Japanese and I think Chinese, these are in the form of subject, object, verb. So it's just a different ordering of the words to give a meaning. And so I have an example over here of an individual character. And then you have an apple, which is composed. The word apple is composed of individual characters. Or like in Japanese, Ringo is composed of three different kana. And then a language would put those words together in a sequence. Like I ate an apple. Or in Japanese, watashi wa ringo o tabemashita. And so... Other things you can put in a language, a human language, are modifiers such as adjectives or adverbs, which modify the nouns or the verbs. Prepositions, which are kind of like things like at or just another like a sentence fragment or a, uh, I forget what it's called, but it basically is a segment that modifies a sentence. But the problem with parsing a human language in a computer are the exceptions. Uh, so this is like another one of those NP-hard problems. Uh, I don't know if it'll ever be solved, but idioms, uh, things like don't count your chickens before they're hatched. Uh, whenever you say that, you're not really expecting your chickens to hatch. It's just a, a saying or an idiom. So that makes parsing a human language very difficult. I saw this other thing called porosity. Um, it's more uh, referring to the tone uh, when you're speaking uh, a sentence. Like questions, you have the rising intonation or tone. Uh, and also it gives you can give you a sense of like somebody using sarcasm or somebody's emotional state and things like that. So computer word is kind of totally different. So I'm coming from the perspective of a programming language. Uh, like Java or C or Python or whatever. So a computer word is a string of characters. Um, characters are basically stored on the computer as integers or bytes. Uh, a byte is basically seven or eight bits, depending on the architecture. And uh, these eight bits can make a number between, usually between 0 and 255. And basically, each uh, character can be translated from its character value to a human letter, such as A through Z, through its ASCII value. So there's, and I didn't have an example of this, but I think you can just like type in any search engine like ASCII character chart, and just go to images, and you can usually find this. Uh, on any site, but you can see here like A starts at 65 and Z goes through 90. So I usually remember A is 65, capital A is 65, lowercase a is 97, and then you can derive the other letters by adding 
the offset from A to that. But that's basically how those letters get translated into something that can be stored on the computer as a byte. And if you're interested, these uh, integers uh, are basically powers of 2. So you start on the right side. Uh, 2 through the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1st is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128. So basically, you take that representation of that character. So like we said, the capital A is 65. Then you can say, hey, I can subtract off 64 from 65. So that puts a 1 there. And then you keep going and keep trying to subtract off numbers like a 32 with that remainder. And until you can subtract off another number, those will be zeros. So that's how basically a quick and dirty method for translating a binary number uh, or a, a decimal number like a 65 into binary. So computer language is a collection of these words. Uh, there's something called Bacchus Nauer form. I remember doing this a long time ago. It's also sometimes referred to as a context-free grammar. Uh, basically, it's the ordering of tokens and how these words relate to each other to give them meanings. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see here in, in this little example is how to define a postal address. So you got like the different parts like the street and the zip code and the state and basically this Bacchus Nauer form you have these different rules so you have the thing on the left side basically equals the part on the right side <laughs> and I was going to do a quick demo uh, I have another book over here which from college let me switch back over and stop screen share so yeah Lex and Yak the Raleigh book uh, Yak is yet another compiler. Compiler Lex is a lexical analyzer. So basically, the Lexer is a scanner, so it can look over the characters in a file and pull out the individual tokens or words um, from that file. So going to switch over here. So. Lex and Yak were for the, I believe they were for the old Sun Systems. Now there is a GNU equivalent, uh, a free and open source equivalent of Lex and Yak called Flex and Bison. Uh, so I have a couple, of, and they're basically the same thing. Flex is Lex and Bison is Yak. So it's kind of like <laughs> animals and things like that. Uh, so here's an example of a Lexer. I created this uh, city scanner dot l see if this works so basically you go in here and you can put c code in here at the top so i want to track the number of cities and states so i have integers to recognize those i want to return tokens you really don't have to worry about that part but here's the part where it actually takes these words and can gives them values so you can write c code so for instance, if it sees Tennessee, then it's going to add the state counter. If it sees Georgia, it's going to add the state counter. Or I have like various cities in here, like Oak Ridge, Knoxville, Atlanta. It's going to add to the city counter. And then I just have a main here, which, uh, which I'll show here in a second, which actually prints out those values. So I'm going to do cityscanner.exe. I have a make file for this too, which I'll show in a second. But I'll, I'll just say, uh, I live in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, I'm from Georgia. And do a control C. So it actually detected the city and states right there in front of those values. And then once I close the program, it actually returns how many cities and states that it found. So it's found two states and one city. Now, the parser, on the other hand, I have a city parser dot uh, y, which is the bison or, or yak program. You can actually take these tokens that it returns and add additional meaning. This is like the semantics, the ordering of the tokens, the ordering of the words to actually make it do something. Uh, so, yeah, this basically just finds when you have a city and state pair right there. So, 
I haven't gotten this working exactly right yet. Uh, let me do my city parser. .exe. For some reason, my grammar is backwards, so if I do, like, Tennessee, Knoxville, it finds a city and a state. But if I do, like, at Atlanta, Georgia, then it returns a syntax error. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. I got something wrong in my grammar. But uh, if anybody out there is interested in, like, compiler development or developing your own language. I can see how this could be used to like if you want to make your own game development language, you could use Lex and Yak to do that. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention Turing machines. So this is, uh, my intent of this talk was just to be a really high level, 32,000 feet, not get into the nitty gritty details of any of this, but basically a Turing machine is a representation of a computer uh, it can, basically there's a tape with different characters, it can move the tape uh, left and right, and that will give the computer different states. This is all like theory. Uh, somebody may have actually implemented a Turing machine and software, but basically it's more of a theoretical concept. Then there's an also a concept of a three-tape Turing machine to give it more uh, complexity. Uh, just also going to mention differences between a compiler and assembler. A compiler converts your language that you've developed into assembly code. Then assembly code is then uh, uh, assembled down into an actual image, or the ones and zeros that actually get put on. There's actually a scheduler that actually goes through, and there's a program counter that goes through this image and runs each command sequentially. Not going to get into that. Okay, so I did a little bit of research on how humans recognize different objects, uh, basically by shape, color, and size. That's my very simplistic view of it. There's actually a Wikipedia page out there that goes into tons of detail on this. But I was thinking of an example, like if you look at these two objects right here, it's very difficult to determine what these are, just especially if you just look at them quickly. But if you give them color, then it's easier to see that, hey, this is an orange and that's a lemon. And that's just only because of the color of the objects. And I could see how this could apply to game design, um, how you can make things different colors to make them stand out or give them different meaning. So now I'm going to talk about the long-term memory a little bit. So they say that long-term memory, there's an unlimited amount for a human's long-term memory. I was thinking of an example like Street Fighter. I don't think until the day I die I will ever forget how to throw like a fireball, a Hadouken. I'll always remember it's down, down, forward, forward, uh, and, that, and then punch, and that gives you a fireball. Uh, does long-term memory fade out over time? I'm not sure. Uh, like I said, some things may last forever, some things may fade over time. There's this thing called rote learning. And that's basically repeating the same actions over and over. And that will kind of burn things into your memory. Uh, this can be used for pattern memorization. An example I think of is Mortal Kombat, especially the later ones like Mortal Kombat 3. Basically doing these same button presses over and over, eventually that gets burned into your long-term memory. So you, you just do them automatically. And... And you don't ever forget these. Another example is like enemy movements, especially in older games. You kind of memorize the different patterns that the enemies move. So you use that as an advantage uh, when you fight an enemy because you know it's going to follow the same pattern each time. And also, as I mentioned a little bit, muscle memory. Uh, that's basically... The example I always think of is driving a stick shift car. I mean, once you do it enough times, you don't even think about going from first gear to second gear to third gear. You just do it automatically. It's just something that comes naturally. So another factor in game design for, for humans is reaction time. So whenever something happens on the screen, you want the player to respond with a with an action, a button press, or the lack of an action, just doing nothing. Um, whenever I think about reaction time, I always think of like the old uh, wristwatch 
uh, uh, watches. I used to have one like this when I was a kid, and it would show times to the hundredths of a second. So I always like try to see how fast I could press the stop button or try to get the button, get the hundredths of a second to land on a certain number. Um, and reaction times, there's been uh, something called Fitz Law, and I can't tell you uh, all the details of Fitz Law. It's an equation out there, which I'll pull up here. And basically, it correlates a human's reaction time to, like, the stimulus. So, let me share this back out. Share. Share. So it's ID equals log base 2 of 2D over W. Um, people that do this for a living probably have more of an idea of, of this than I do. But basically, it's a target, and the target's noise relates to the reaction time. So I'll just put, I'm just mentioning this. So I know it's a very big concept in human-computer interaction. And also there's different ways to, uh, let's see here, called the keystroke level model and GOMS. Those are two different ways to actually determine if you're designing the system uh, appropriately for a human. Let's see here, GOMS. Yeah, GOMS method in human computer interaction. So on Wikipedia, they describe it as the user's cognitive structure or components. So GOMS stands for goals, operators, methods, and selections or rules. So again, just mentioning this as a high level uh, concept in computer interaction. Uh, and also the keystroke level model. So from my notes that I was reading, the keystroke level model is a way for defining the methods in GOMS. Keystroke level model. Mm. The keystroke level model predicts how long it will take an expert user to accomplish a routine task without errors using an interactive computer system. So it's just a way to measure whether the interface that you developed is a, a good one for uh, doing a task. So I actually went through and did a, an example here of Mike Tyson's punch out. The Mike Tyson fight, which is like one of the most difficult uh, end bosses for NES games. So I actually used my emulator, uh, went through the Tyson fight, or at least just one punch, in the initial stages of the Tyson fight, where he can knock you down with one punch. So I have the frame numbers down here and the offsets. That's what these plus zero, plus threes. So the first noticeable change is, which is at time, at frame plus zero, Tyson will go off for one frame off to the side a little bit. You can actually see a visible change in his stance at plus three frames. Then he'll actually give you a visual flash after four frames. And then after 14 frames, and this is at 60 frames a second, then he'll actually start the hit animation. And if you haven't started dodging by this frame, you're hit and you're knocked down. And then you actually get the feedback that you've been hit on the 22nd frame. So I actually converted these frames to hundredths of a second. So, um, one frame at 60 frames a second, which I get into in a little bit, is 1.66666 repeating seconds. So this is how many hundredths of a second you have. So basically you have, from the time he starts his windup, you have 23 hundredths of a second to start dodging. So that's kind of like the small hundredths of a second on our Casio wristwatch example right there. So there's a neat website out there called the Human Benchmark, and I have a better uh, graph of it here, which I kind of uh, changed a little bit or made it stand out a little bit more. But they basically take, uh, they have a example of like a screen changing colors, and just ordinary people will go on there and see how fast 
they can detect the change in the color on the screen. So they actually have some pretty good uh, data that they've collected over time of how long it takes a human to detect in a change in screen color. So like the fastest of fastest people are about mm, 180 milliseconds, which is uh, 18, 18 hundredths of a second. So that's at 60 frames a second, that's 11 frames. Then, and these aren't like, I color coded this, but these aren't specific percentiles. I think I did it like every 0.2 seconds on this graph. I have these color bands. So you can kind of relate the data that they've collected on human reaction time, which they did in milliseconds, to frame time, which I follow a lot of fighting games. If you play fighting games, a lot of times people talk about frame time at 60 frames a second. So you hear people talk about 10 or 11 frame moves, which is a very fast move or like a 15 or 16 frame move, which is one of your slower moves. So you can see if you use like a 16 frame move, somebody actually has time to react to that. But a team frame move, that's almost impossible to react to uh, just due to uh, human reaction time. Uh, yeah, so you can see this is basically your typical bell-shaped curve. It looks like the average human reaction time is like at 27 milliseconds. That's your average. But you have your expert players here that are down to 20th, uh, 20 hundredths of a second. So if we go back and look at our Tyson fight, somebody with really fast reaction time could actually react in 23 hundredths of a second um, to this punch. Uh, other factors in designing reaction time, input delay. I've always heard that if you're playing a game on PC, uh, you have a faster like time from when you press the button to when it registers with the game compared to a PS4, which has a little bit of input delay. Uh, also, I've heard a lot about like the difference between a CRT monitor and an LCD monitor. Some people apparently say that a CRT, you have faster reaction time, faster feedback time than an LCD monitor. I've seen other people do, like there's a video out there of people playing Mike Tyson punch out and say, hey, there's not a bit of difference between an LCD monitor and a CRT monitor. So I think there needs to be more study done on that. Uh, some LCD screens do have a game mode though. So it's supposed to feed speed up that feedback time on the display. And also you got to work look at if you're making a network game, the network latency, if you're like having to communicate, sending packets over the wire across the country, there's going to be some delay in the amount of time that it takes to uh, give that feedback. And also a little bit different to reaction time is anticipation and timing. Uh, anticipation is basically, hey, you know something's going to happen. So I got an example of Parappa the Rapper here. So they actually tell you what buttons to press and basically at what time. So basically you know what's going to happen. There's no reaction to it. You just got to press that button on the right time. Uh, this is similar to quick time events, but quick time events is like, okay, uh, usually they tell you the button. I have an example here of Lost Odyssey. They give you the button to press and then you see like a ring or something that tells you what time to actually press that button, which I don't think that's very interesting. I mean, you can train like a monkey to press a game or press buttons at a certain time, but I know music games are very popular. Another factor is decision making in the game. I was thinking of kind of like the quest for fun presentation that Mike Neal did. I think this kind of relates to that. You can, what makes a game fun to humans is the different alternatives. Now you can have a game, have an example here, Final Fantasy 13. Basically they call that on rails. It's just like one long tunnel that you keep going through. There's really not any decision making going on for the human in that case. I think it does end up, open up a little bit in chapter 11. But uh, basically, you, you just keep going forward. 
Now, a game like Breath of the Wild, in my opinion, that's kind of like an open world game where you have tons of decisions to make, but they really don't do any hand-holding. It's like, I, it's up to you to go out and explore and uh, find out what you need to do next. I think the compromise between these two is a game like Crazy Taxi that kind of give you an arrow to go to the next location. That may be a little bit too hand-holding as well, too much hand-holding as well. I know a lot of games will give you a mini-map and kind of like put like little markers on where you should go just to give the player some idea of what to do next. So I think it's kind of like a, a compromise between being completely on rails or being completely wide open where you don't know what in the world you're supposed to do. This thing called cognitive complexity theory, which I'm, I'm just putting the term out there. I did a little bit of research on it, but basically it's a measure of, of the amount of, uh, of the decision-making potential of a human, whether a human can determine changes in an environment and things like that. Another important thing you got to be aware of when designing an interface for a game is recognition versus recall. Uh, this is pretty standard. Uh, they always say that recognition is a lot easier than recall for a human. Uh, I have an example here of Angry Birds. So on Angry Birds, uh, you have the stage select screen. And all it has is numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So... I, can, I consider this kind of as a, a not optimal interface because it's up for the person, the human, to make that connection between, hey, level 11 is the level with with whatever I wanted to play, with the big, the bomb birds or the, the distinct level that I wanted to play. But I have an example here of Street Fighter V, the level select, which I think this is a little bit better design. Hey, you go over, you highlight over each of these different buttons and it will give you like a little preview of the stage that you want to play as another example is space quest or any of the old like sierra text adventure games uh, in the older games they made it so that you actually had to type in exactly what you wanted to do like in this example they have buy hat but it's up for the human to remember uh, exactly what sequence of words or what words, like it could be purchase hat or acquire hat, but in this case it's buy hat. So in the later games, I made it a little bit better so you, that you actually just click on the button, the buy button or the move button or the talk button or the smell button or whatever. So this really does, doesn't apply to modern day games, but just to look back at how games used to be made where you actually had to remember exactly what you had to type to get some get something to happen and also in designing games you got to look at especially single player games artificial intelligence components there's been tons of uh talks and 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 different uh, research on artificial intelligence uh, a lot of times you'll hear about game trees and this could be a whole talk on its own but basically you start out with like kind of kind of like I was talking about earlier, the di different decisions. Uh, you create a tree with different nodes, and you have all the decisions on all these different nodes of the trees. And basically, you give give each of these branches a weight. So you start pruning this tree and cutting off branches to find the optimal decision for the player to make. Now, one thing I didn't like about older games. A lot of times, an artificial intelligent opponent would break the rules of the game. So like in Street Fighter 2, especially the original version for the SNES, like one of your opponents, the computer opponent, could do a flash kick without even charging the kick. Or like M. Bison could do the Psycho Crusher without holding back for two seconds. So I think that's bad game design just because you would expect the computer opponent to behave the same way as a human opponent would. And also some other games like RC Pro-Am, there would be like one car, the tan car, that would have a super boost ability. I mean, this is supposed to be, all cars are supposed to be the same, but one car had this cheat where it could boost 
and go past everyone else. So I just kind of think that's bad game design because this this eliminates this gives the player no possible way to win if one player if a computer po- opponent can break the rules of the game to complete the objective. And while I'm talking about AI, is true AI possible? I don't think so. I know there's a big push right now for AI. There was an article that I read for another class back in college called Bill Joy, Bill Joy who actually was at Sun Microsystems. Uh, he developed the VI editor. He wrote an et- article called Why the Future Doesn't Need Us in the year 2000. So basically, it's, it went, went on about why computers... Uh, re- would eventually replace humans and things like that. One uh, language I did use back in college was called Prolog, and it was billed as being an artificial intelligence language. Uh, I don't have an example. I do have some example code of Prolog right here. What they call it's basically called an inference engine. So it's basically a set of rules so you can define a relationship between, like in this example, a mother and a child. A father and a child, and a relationship between two siblings. So, if a parent is the parent, or if a person is a parent of two different ch- children, then we have a rule that says those two children are siblings, uh, because sibling X or person X and person Y, they're both the uh, child of parent Z and child, and both are basically the parent. The child of one specific parent, which makes them siblings. So then you can assign value uh, to these. So you can say, Treat is the mother of Sally, and Tom is the father of Sally and Erica. So you can define these rules, and then you can query the engine and say, Hey, is this person related to this other person by what relationship? Another important thing in... Developing games, developing AI components is random number generators. I don't think anything on a computer is truly random. There's random number tables out there. You can actually find these in old books. Uh, and typically, these rum- number random number tables uh, generate random numbers by seeding uh, the random number generator with uh, another value. Typically, time, because time goes by so quickly it's good enough to give you a pseudo random number to use in your game so you can use random numbers to uh, determine what action a computer opponent will take Uh, because if the computer opponent does the same thing every single time then you get into finding a pattern or the computer opponent can become very predictable so we use random numbers sometimes called rng you see people online complain about rng uh, with computer opponents or in other things like generating loot like i used to play world of warcraft and that whenever you beat a raid boss it would drop a loot so the loot that you get is dependent on the not random number generator typically uh, to determine what loot is drop. And another interesting thing is like if you use the same seed, uh, if you don't use time, if you use a constant value, uh, arbitrary value for the seed, you will always generate the same random number sequence at a time. So I think that would be useful. I always had an idea about developing a Tetris game, a network Tetris game. So you would just um, use the same seed for both players to get the same sequence of blocks because you would be getting the same uh, random number gener- random numbers generated to pick the pieces that you want to give the players. And here's another example. I was going to hide this right here. I can pull it off to the side. Here's an example of one of the fighting games I played, Tekken 7. Uh, just going to say, if you play lo- games long enough, you'll start to see uh, how these games are constructed. And I think this is another, an interesting way, if you are getting into game design, a good uh, uh, exercise to do just as you're playing games. So uh, typically you'll just see a screen with bars and characters and values. But 
the way a computer or game programmer will see this, you can deconstruct this into its individual atomic values. So you start to see a health bar as an inner integer value. The number of rounds is an integer value. Uh, the countdown timer, it looks like it's an integer, but it's actually a float. Uh, so you can actually use like time, delta time, and unity to keep subtracting that float uh, to get the current time left in the round. Uh, then basically what you do is you use like a floor or ceiling uh, uh, function to convert that into an integer that is then displayed. But then you have things like your name, that's a string, and then your rank is an integer, and win streak is an integer. And then when you hit somebody, that's an integer as well. And then you can deconstruct this into the actual models. You can see two models here. And then each model has a position in the world, which is a uh, vector three in unity, which is basically a collection of three floats. So yeah, that's my high-level overview of human-computer interaction. Uh, there's a you can definitely go in a lot deeper into this subject and um, pick out the individual concepts and things like that. Like some of the things I talked about earlier, like GOMs and cognitive complexity. There's like been complete tons and tons of written about those. So I definitely recommend going out and. Uh, looking more looking into that a little bit deeper if anyone out there is interested in human computer interaction so that's basically all i have for this month uh hey dylan uh did you have anything else you wanted to share this month nah I'm, that was it <laughs> yeah be sure to go out and check check out dylan's website uh dylanwolf.com and uh, Dylan Wolf on Twitter. Uh, I'm LeviDSmith.com on the web and uh, Gotech Grad on Twitter. And we were talking about it earlier. I am putting the old episodes of this show on Twitch, on my uh, Twitch channel, and I've been putting those on rerun. So if anybody's interested in going back and watching any of these shows, Knoxville Game Design Meetings, we've been doing this for, well, the old show started like two years ago, but we started doing this online format about a year ago. So we have like hours and hours of content uh, that I'm uploading to Twitch. And it, it's... A, it's also available on, on YouTube as well. So I'm just trying to give people out there multiple options for watching this show. So I guess that's going to wrap it up for April 2018. Again, we'll be meeting on, uh, let's see here, April 20th, two weeks away, a little bit less than two weeks away for the Ludendari kickoff. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll have a lot of cool games developed for Knoxville Game Design. And, uh, yeah, so we'll be back in a month. Thanks, everyone, for watching. <laughs>